sounds like some really good discussion has started and, and triggered some curiosity and some thinking and probably helped define maybe even on, an, on a less conscious level, perhaps helped you define what resilience is and, and those discussions will be bringing up different things for, for us differently as well. So we acknowledge it's quite a complex topic. It's not just a one size fits all as we're hearing from our different perspectives coming out. Um, it's something that is quite complex. So this is one definition. So Abraham, this is out of an article back in 04, talks about it capturing a number of different processes and needs to be viewed as a collection of factors rather than a one size fits all approach or a, a single way of doing things or a single approach or, or technique to managing things. So with that in mind, th this is our, our most comprehensive way of defining resilience from our perspective and, and through the field of psychology. So the first one is thinking about this, the ability to be able to adjust. So probably something that we've had over the last two years is a number of examples or instances where adversity or challenges have been prevalent or, or ongoing perhaps. And so you can see the reference here to Block and Cream, and although this has come up in, in various forms around resilience, is the ability to be able to adjust quickly so the, that agility to those demands being changing and particularly the recovery. And the recovery might sound like you might've even heard this term before, the ability to bounce back. And I heard someone actually recently talking about this and they said, I really like the analogy of bouncing forward, <laughs> which is sort of nice too. Um, but bounce back, if you think about the, the metaphor of that being like a, a rubber ball or a, you know, it's a tennis ball or something that you, you know, hit against the wall again and again and again and again, and it, it comes back. So it's not just about strength in that metaphor, is it? It's not just about the, um, the hardness of an object. If you think about concrete or brick and you, you throw that enough times, it's going to break down, it's going to disintegrate. So it's not just about strength, although we may need strength. Uh, it's also about that agility and the flexibility that might come with that. So a rubber ball might be a, a way of visualising that concept. And then we think about our ability to manage stress. So if we're managing stress or our resilience is in check and we're not hitting burnout, then our ability to cope with the stress coming my way is bigger, is more in my control than the stress itself, the stimulus itself. So the opposite would be, I'm so overwhelmed, I'm not coping, it's all coming at me like a wave, I can't keep up, I just feel like I'm always chasing my tail, I can just never get ahead, I'm, I feel like I'm drowning. So any, any language or, or phrases around that would be the opposite of managing or coping around those stress levels. So our, our ability mentally, physically or otherwise to cope or manage the stress that we're being dealt. So with that in mind then, resilient people are the great benefit, are then more competent or able to manage their emotions, to regulate their emotions in an ongoing way. And therefore we can sit with distress when it comes. It might not be comfortable, it might not be nice, but we get better at managing it. So the old adage that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger is kind of true in that way. When they look at the research that people that have been through significant trauma and adversity are much better at managing it down the track in the same or lesser form. So it does teach us in a way on how to cope or how to cope better, as long as we do bounce back. So the opposite would be staying in distress, not recovering from that and allowing that to consume me and then moving into a mental health category such as prolonged depression or anxiety, for example. So those of you talking about burnout, you might be seeing some of the signals and thinking about where, where and when to intervene, to have the conversation, to, to bring it up versus letting it go and just keeping an eye on it. And those signals are something that will really encourage you to be observing and, and taking into account in terms of how to approach these conversations. Any questions or comments on these definitions here? few different viewpoints. And as we say, we don't think it's just one or the other. It's really a, a comprehensive look. Makes sense. Yeah. 
Okay, great. Um, this is just the reminder, or it's quite a nice analogy here, really, a couple of things to come out of this. So when once upon a time, we were all learning to walk, or we might be around small children. So I've got a, I've currently got a three year old, a seven year old and nine year old, I just had to check my they've all just turned those ages in the last six weeks. So all at once. Um, but over lockdown, you know, I've had some really, really challenging times over the past two years here in Melbourne, as you many of you all know, the Long, the ongoing lockdowns have meant ongoing remote learning, remote schooling, closed access to childcare. Um, workload has been increasing because everybody wants virtual deliveries, which happened to be something that I was already quite up and running with when early March, April last year kicked off 2020 and everyone moved to remote uh, training. It was something that I was already running through the UK and Singapore and, and some other providers that I work with. And so as that workload really increased and I had three small children trying to, two of them do school daily tasks and a, and a child that usually would be at preschool not able to attend, I hit complete burnout. So I, I know certainly I was physically, mentally and emotionally completely burnt out by around August last year. And that was something that I had to really flag for myself and, and learn from in terms of recovery and management. And I must say this year, as much as I was triggered as we went back into lockdown with many of those emotions, physically and mentally, um, I, I did get better at managing it. So I did learn something from last year that I was able to take into this year. This image is more speaking to the fact that once upon a time, whether you've got young children around and it's very familiar or, or we just trust that once upon a time we learnt to walk, the, the way that we encourage it or the way that we motivate a child to walk if you think about that for a moment. So they're, they're crawling away and then at some point they, they get up on their feet and they're a bit wobbly and they don't probably walk straight away. They might take a step and fall back down and try and get up and take a step and fall back down. As parents, of course, we don't say, oh, well, you're just not very good at walking. It's not your thing. Don't worry. Of course, we, we encourage them. We motivate them. We praise them. We help them. We guide them. They do it again. They get a bit better. They do it again. They improve again. Um, so it's just that reminder that resilience, it, it takes time. It takes effort. It's not just a, a once off get it wrong, too bad, don't try again. So the perseverance is there and it's very innate in us, like learning to walk. And, but also each time we do it, we learn something different, don't we? So a child gets to a point where they can start navigating objects or different surfaces or different textures that they're walking on. So each time we're learning, each time we're growing. So the parent here is a little like us as leaders, as managers, thinking about the way we support versus challenge our people. And again, the child analogy is useful because if you think when your child does fall over, where's your default tendency? Is it to go to, oh no, you know, the support, I'm 100% just, are you okay? Let me help. Or is there that element of challenge? You'll be right, get back up, you're okay, come on, you can do it. So you might even think about your default response if you've been around young children, your own or nephews and nieces, etc. And thinking about, do you default to, to support? Or do you support? Do you default more to a challenge? And that might give you some insight as we explore that model further in a moment. Hi, I'm Emmy Golding, Director of Psychology for the Workplace Mental Health Institute. We hope you liked the video. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. We have more and more videos being released each week. So when you subscribe, you'll get a notification letting you know when a new one's just been published. So make sure to hit that subscribe button and don't miss out on this vital information for yourself, your colleagues and your loved ones.